I would first like to extend a special thank you to Atlas for providing me with a code for this game. It's honestly pretty humbling to see that my channel has grown to the point of being so directly acknowledged by a developer. Now onto the video. Persona 5 Tactica is one of the most lukewarm reveals for a video game I have ever experienced. There was little to no buzz about this game upon reveal or during the wait for this game. I get a sneaking suspicion that either this game or Persona 3 Reload was supposed to come out earlier, but one or the other just wasn't quite ready yet. This resulted in Persona 5 Tactica being completely eclipsed by not only Persona 3 Reload, but also Metaphor Re Fantasio. One spin-off game against two behemoths of game reveals? Yeah, this game stood no chance. Nonetheless, here it is. I'm not here to measure the game on the same metric as these bigger, more anticipated releases. I just want to talk about the game as it is. This isn't going to be a full-blown comprehensive breakdown like a lot of my other videos. I'm only going to be covering up to the point that I've currently played to. I have yet to finish the game as of now, so this video may not be my complete thoughts on the game. This will be more of a first impressions video, which isn't something I normally do on this channel. I usually like to complete these games and sit on them for a while so I can process it all first. Something like this is usually a little too reactionary for me, but it might be a good change of pace. That being said, spoilers for the first and some of the second world of the game will still be inevitable. If you would like a completely fresh experience, I recommend you play the game for yourself first. This is your only warning. All that being said, let us begin. So throughout the entire advertising campaign for this game, I noticed that they were really, really emphasizing gameplay above everything else. And that wasn't a good sign to me. The only thing we really knew at the time was the premise. And the reason this had me skeptical about the game's story is because it sounded like another run-of-the-mill Persona spin-off story. Now that I've actually got a good chunk of hours into the game, I can firmly say... It's exactly what you think it is. It's Persona Q3 New Tactical Labyrinth, basically. The Phantom Thieves are chillin', and then they're transported to another world. Not quite like the Metaverse, or the TV world, or the Dark Hour, but they can still use their Personas. At this point, I was already predicting events before they were even happening. You meet the first bad guy of the game, you're backed into a corner, you lose all your party members except Morgana. This is the part where I was thinking, oh, the new character's gonna pop in and save them. And it happened. That's Arena, by the way. You do slowly gain your comrades back. Then you meet the other new character, Toshiro, who is both the adult and the amnesiac of the group. You find out the bad guy of this world is basically enslaving the natives and you have to stop them. The villain is also tied to the amnesiac's memory in some way. Oh look, a projector. I wonder if this is the part where they tell you the guy's connection with the villain. Stellar. Not even sprinkled throughout the castle. No piecing the puzzle together or anything. It's all just one projector, all of the backstory at once. Great. The baggage character learns some valuable lesson, you defeat the villain, and then you get a very unsubtle hint about Toshiro's memory. Like, she straight up tells you Toshiro's a scumbag, and says it'd be better if we never found out. Oh boy, that sure sounds promising. So now the door exiting the world is open, and everyone goes through it. Then you get transported to another world that isn't yours. And now you have yet another oppressor to liberate the natives of this world from. Hmm. Okay. So at this point, I think I already have this whole game's plot figured out. I have predicted every plot beat so far. I would not blame anyone for losing interest in the story at this point and just skipping most of the non-major event dialogue. Which brings me to my next point. 
Honestly, I have nothing else to say about the story, so let's talk about the optional dialogue and the character interactions. So in between missions, you can chill at your safe haven, which is basically just the LeBlanc of that time period. Aside from prep work, you can also talk with your party members for some character exchanges. Basically, just like strolls from Persona Q. Yeah, really not beating those allegations, but that's okay. At this point, I'm not even so bothered by the similarity to Q. I'm more bothered by how the character interactions, one of the things that made Q enjoyable to begin with, are just so uninteresting in this game. The appeal of these interactions before was seeing how the different casts of the different games interacted with each other, at least in Q1. I liked seeing C's question if they'll be able to function as a team without the strong bond that kept the investigation team together. I liked seeing Yosuke and the others feel small in comparison to C's because their cause isn't as grand or noble. In this game, it's just the Phantom Thieves. Granted, this is probably much better than having the casts of 3, 4, and 5 fighting for screen time in Q2, but the issue now is that we already know the Phantom Thieves. We know how they bounce off each other and their whole group dynamic. It doesn't seem like they're really doing anything new with the Phantom Thieves here, so a lot of this new dialogue just feels pointless. Ryuji does his Ryuji thing and everyone laughs, Futaba does her gamer thing and everyone cringes. I wouldn't want the characters to drastically change or anything like that, but it's just... we've done this already, haven't we? It feels very samey. The interactions with the two new characters have the potential to be interesting, but it honestly wears off pretty quickly. By the time you're a good chunk of the way into the first world, you already have a good grasp on what kind of characters these two are. Irina can't bear to see anyone being oppressed and is basically the embodiment of the game's theme of rebellion. That was also the theme of Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal as well. But those games meant it in a much more modern sense. Tactica takes the idea of rebellion to a very literal level, or perhaps the next step up from rebellion, revolution. It's a nice idea and really befitting for a tactical RPG, but it gets stale pretty quickly. Any dialogue that isn't a major story event is just boring. The only reason I even engage with these little exchanges between missions is for the GP, or growth points. Speaking of which, now's about time we talk about the main appeal of this game. Something I should establish before getting into the gameplay is that I don't really play tactical RPGs. The only one I've ever beaten is Devil Survivor Overclocked. While that game is more about bursting down your enemies as quickly as possible, Persona 5 Tactica takes on a more defensive style approach. The name of the game here is to always stand behind a wall and expose the enemies from their cover to strike them while they're vulnerable. I've heard some people compare this game to Mario and Rabbids, but I've never played that game. The way you make enemies behind a cover vulnerable is really up to you. You can hit enemies away with varying trajectories depending on the attack, bait them out of cover, or the most reliable way for me, using status ailments. Attack properties are not exactly like they were in the other Persona or Megami Tensei games in general. Skills aren't defined by elements, and exploiting weaknesses is not a thing in this game. Skills are defined by their effects. Most of them inflict a status, some of them move the enemies around, and some of them do both. These are guaranteed effects by the way. Anyone inflicted with a status ailment or not behind cover are automatically susceptible to critical hits. These reward the assailant with a one more, which can be chained with other critical hits as well. However, just like in all the other Persona games, the one tool you have over the enemies is the power of your all-out attack. They work a little differently than in other Persona games. Due to the nature of the game and how enemies are all sprawled across the map, you can initiate a triple threat after knocking down just one enemy. If you spread out your units far enough, you can actually damage as many enemies as you can fit within the damage zone, even if the surrounding enemies aren't knocked down. But of course, knocking down more enemies is always better. 
It's not just how you deal with enemies. The terrain and obstacles also have a major impact. Some walls just resist attacks, and some walls straight up block them. The elevation of the terrain can affect how and where you can attack. You have enemies that react immediately to your attacks, but leave themselves vulnerable as a result. You even have exploding barrels that can scatter enemies a little and make them vulnerable. Every battle is a puzzle. The enemy placement and object placements are your puzzle pieces, and your units are your means of moving them into place. While the tutorials are very long, the battle mechanics are pretty well thought out. And of course, it wouldn't be a Persona game without the Personas. Through winning battles, both mandatory and side quests, your characters can gain growth points, or GP. Every character has a static Persona that has their own skills. Despite having their own niches, their skill trees are all branched out in a similar way. You've got your damage boosting passives, your primary skill type, your secondary skill type, super attacks, your HP and SP, etc. Rather than simply spending GP to permanently learn skills, you can actually allocate them as you wish. You can equip and unequip skills as needed. If you learned a skill and then decide later on it'd be better to invest in another, you can reallocate your points accordingly. Arena doesn't have a persona, but the way she learns skills is all the same. If that sounds a little too stiff for you, worry not. The story's not the only thing the game borrows from Persona Q. We also have the return of sub-personas in this game. Instead of having individual levels for each character, your entire party shares a level. This party level determines how high level the personas you can fuse are. Personas only have two skill slots. One is their inherent skill, which you can't get rid of. The second slot is for a skill passed on through fusion. This is definitely more restrictive than the other games in the series, but it's still enough to get by. Honestly, despite the different effects of each status ailment, they're all effectively doing the same thing. They leave enemies vulnerable for a crit, and that's usually all that matters. You don't really have to put too much thought into what kind of spells you want to pass on. Sure, the extra options are nice and even handy in certain situations, but it's better in most cases to fill that second slot with a passive. Hell, I have some sub-personas with only passive skills. It's quite helpful if you play RPGs more offensively like me. I have characters like Ryuji and Haru with sub-personas meant to boost damage in as many scenarios as possible. When not covered, when knocked down, when inflicted with the status, you name it. I gave my heal and support characters anything that could reduce their damage intake and increase their longevity. If you're greedy for GP like me, I recommend doing all of the optional hangout events and optional quests. The dialogue is worthless, and the reason for most of these quests in story are pretty silly, but the reward is worth it. The quests are really just puzzle fights where you have to figure out the solution they want you to use to complete the objective. Stuff like killing all the enemies within a certain number of turns, or reaching the end of the level within one turn. On one hand, these really demonstrate how you can take advantage of one mores to extend your movement, or use the environment to your advantage. On the other hand, some of these solutions are really specific. I did most of these on my own, and reaching the solution was satisfying, but at the cost of a lot of time, like up to 30 minutes sometimes. They are optional, but more GP is always nice. The first boss was pretty interesting. She throws exploding bouquets around and you have to smack them into her. At one point she'll focus entirely on one character and chase them down, so you actually only need to worry about keeping that one character covered from her attacks, while the other two can do whatever. She then later brings out a giant tank and will start driving around sporadically. The game shows you the exact path she's going to take, so you basically just have to bait her into driving into the exploding bouquets. Overall, I'd say Persona 5 Tactica's gameplay is pretty solid. I usually enjoy fast-paced battles like in most of the other RPGs I play, but I didn't really take much issue with the longer battles of this game. In fact, it can be quite satisfying sometimes. The lack of hard weaknesses is an interesting change of pace. You already have enough to worry about needing to constantly hide behind walls and such. The game is simple yet flexible. 
Okay, so now I've talked about the game, but there's one more topic I'd like to bring up. It's something I've noticed popping up a lot recently. So I saw this joke video on Twitter. Persona 5, Persona 5, Persona 5, Persona 5, Persona 5, Persona 5, Persona 5. And I didn't think much else of it. After playing some of the game for myself, I went and asked my audience what they thought of the game. And then I started seeing more of the same thing, but in a less joking manner. There seems to be this weird idea floating around that Atlas gave us this game when they could have given us Persona 6. Like, somehow Persona 5 Tactica is taking away time and resources that Atlas could be using to develop Persona 6? That is so ludicrously wrong, and these people are clearly out of the loop. Persona 6 has been in development for a while now, and I seriously doubt that it's being handled by the same team as Persona 5 Tactica of all games. Okay, Tactica is not siphoning money and labor away from Persona 6. It's funny too because there's another sect of this fandom that seems to think the opposite when it comes to Persona 3 Reload. Like, sure, it's technically possible for Atlas to implement the female route into Persona 3 Reload. It's not like they don't have the skill to do it. It's just way out of their scope for the project. Some people seem to think Atlas is just made of money, or that they have all the time in the world to just delay the game and add another 20 hour campaign on top of a redo of the main campaign. Not every game has the luxury of being delayed for as long as Kingdom Hearts 3, for example. Whether they decide to come back and add these things later or move on to other projects, only time will tell. I know I kind of went on a tangent, but the point I'm trying to get across here is that neither side knows how game development works. One of them thinks Atlas can't work on multiple projects at once, and the other thinks game development is easy. So despite how critical I was of the story, I do think the game has a unique flavor the other Persona games don't quite have. The game is admittedly addicting, however, where I stand now, I don't see myself doing a video covering the whole game once I finish it. I don't really see my thoughts changing that drastically. I'll play this game in my spare time, but I have other projects I'd like to work on. If I end up changing my mind on anything I said in this video, I will come crawling back to make another video saying that I was wrong. As for whether you should play the game or not, come on, you, you know that's never been the point of any of my videos. I'm just a guy, I'm just here to give my two cents. If you're someone who's been dying for a specifically Persona themed tactical RPG, then by all means, give it a shot. The only person whose experience I can speak for though is myself. I know there wasn't a ton of enthusiasm surrounding this game, but from what I'm seeing online people seem to be enjoying it. My only huge concern is that these spin-off games in terms of writing are becoming way too formulaic. Maybe they already have been, but Persona 5 Tactica's story is the epitome of it. In fact, this is probably why initially no one showed interest in the game at first. They had a good grasp on what this game was going to be all about, and just wanted to move on to something new. Thankfully, the game had something new to offer in its gameplay, and the general reception of it seems to be pretty positive. Hopefully, this is enough to encourage Atlas to keep trying new things like this. That's all I really have to say about this game. Thank you guys for watching, thank you to Atlas once again for providing me with the game, and an extra special thank you to my patrons. I can't stress this enough, your support means a lot, and I appreciate your patience given my lack of activity. The short version is that my IRL job is taking up most of my time and energy, which has been bad for video progress. If you want to help make it possible for me to devote more time to these projects, just keep watching, I'm serious, that's all you really need to do. If you'd like to take an extra step further, you can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar. I keep my patrons well up to date and I'm trying to start dropping exclusive previews on some of my longer projects for them. I promise the next video won't take 3 months to make, in fact I'm already halfway through editing a 1 hour plus video. So I'll see you soon, hopefully.